Hey, Mr. P here. In this video, we're going to talk about observation skills, which are fundamental to not only forensic scientists working case, uh, working the cases or working a crime scene, but also uh, serve as really one of the biggest pieces of evidence, uh, if done correctly, from a victim or from an eyewitness testimony standpoint. Um, observation skills are crucial and uh, they're definitely skills that need to be strengthened uh, for, a, for a variety of reasons. But we're going to talk through observation skills and how one can best address the strengthening of the, of the observation skills as well as the importance of observation skills. So let's get started. Making observations are the critical first step in the identification of evidence uh, in working a crime scene in trying to identify witnesses, in trying to identify other pieces of evidence, and and they have to be done in the in the proper order. So the first thing that a forensic scientist must be able to do when they get to a crime scene is make the observations. And they're going to make the observations with a variety of senses, and we're going to talk about that in a minute, but obviously the most easy the easiest observation to make is one that you make with your eyes um, you get to a crime scene and I'm speaking on the behalf of a forensic investigator or a forensic scientist a crime scene investigator you know CSI technician you get to a crime scene the first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna make observations using your eyeballs obviously you're gonna scan the scene you're going to identify pieces of evidence that look like they belong and pieces of evidence that look like they don't belong and you're going to focus on those and you're going to work methodically through the crime scene making the observations until you get to a point where you have to interpret the observations at this point you're going to use your brain you're going to hopefully make connections between what is likely a part of the crime scene and what is legitimate evidence and what is or was part of that scene prior to the crime happening um, there are a lot of pieces of I mean, just think about your own room or your own house there's probably a lot of things that maybe might look like they're tied to a crime scene, um, but are actually not, right? And then once you interpret the observations, you use your brain, you use critical thinking, you, you use problem-solving skills, uh, you've made the observations, you've now used your brain and interpreted those observations, you have to report the observations you made accurately, okay? You have to report them professionally, you have to report them accurately, you have to report them in a timely manner, you have to report them methodically, um, all of your I's need to be dotted and T's need to be crossed, so to speak. And so what is an observation or what can be an observation? Observations are any bits of information that are gathered by our senses. And our senses, as you've learned since probably kindergarten, are anything that you use your senses for, like sight, taste, hearing, smell, touch. Obviously, you're going to use ears to pick up sounds. Those sounds can definitely be observations. Right? When you walk through a, a particular set of woods or a particular field, you're obviously going to hear things and sounds that potentially belong in that scene or potentially don't belong. If they are sounds that you feel belong to that particular scene, you're probably going to kind of filter them out, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But um, you pick up on observations or bits of information that are likely out of place for that particular scene more easily than, than observations or sounds or sights or tastes that uh, you feel belong in that scene. So you can use your ears, obviously, to pick up hearing um, or sounds. You can use your sense of touch to pick up feelings, to pick up textures. Um, nose is obviously going to pick up smells. Your eyes are going to pick up sights, and your taste buds are going to pick up taste. Now, the thing that crime scene investigators probably use the most are obviously their ears and their eyes, obviously because those are the pieces of information that are likely going to be more tied to crime scenes. Um, it's probably easy to understand at this point that a CSI technician is not going to work through a crime scene using his nose and or tongue in order to feel out and, um, and taste Bits of you know bits of evidence or bits of crime scene, but um, there might definitely be pieces of evidence that are putting off an odor. You know potential toxins, potential um, substances, likely will put off a, a a smell that a technician would need to pick up on. So observations are made without thinking, and it is incredibly important to our survival. You are picking up using your senses bits of information 
24-7, 365. Um, if you are in a particular scene, you're just you're soaking up all of this bits of information, and so it can be overwhelming. And so why are we not aware of all the information our senses are gathering at any time? Like when you walk into a room, you are picking up smells, and you're picking up sights, and you're picking up temperatures, and you're picking up humidity, and you're picking up um, wind currents. I mean, all of this is is a physiological response to your ability to understand and sense the world around you. And so why are we not just overloaded with all of this information kind of coming into our brain or flooding into our brain at the same time? And the idea is that we don't innately want all of this information flowing in, cluttering up our thoughts, um, you know, crashing our circuit board, so to speak. And so you unconsciously apply a filter, and that's what I was talking about before. You can unconsciously apply filters that likely will filter out things that you feel are, are positive and are uh, comfortable and are a normal part of a particular scene, and you easily or more easily focus on the things that you feel should not be a normal part of that scene. Okay, When you're walking down a street and all of a sudden you hear a crash, that loud crash is not likely part of that normal scene and you instantly pick up on that and you'll instantly look. That was your sense of hearing. Making an observation, you then used your brain to kind of filter out all the things that are not important. That was a um, likely more important sound for survival and so you simply pay attention to that thing um, in this case, the, the loud crash, and so you felt like that was more important at that particular moment because it was um, potentially a source of threat. It likely has to do with your individual safety. Um, that goes, you know, for a lot of different things. If you hear somebody yelling, you're going to probably focus on that. If you hear gunshots, you're probably going to focus on that. If you hear a car tire squealing, you're probably going to focus on that, right? Because those are all potential sources of threat. Um, you may not focus on you know, birds chirping in the tree. You may not focus on squirrel chattering in the tree. You may not uh, focus on a cat walking through a yard, right? You might hear it. You might hear it meowing, but you're not going to focus on it like you would gunshots because there just simply isn't as big a source of threat with a cat as there is with a gun. So um, you innately put or place an unconscious filter on a particular set of, of observations and that's just the way our brain is, is hardwired. So how is information processed in the brain? We have to bring up the idea of perception. Um, I'm a glass half full kind of guy, right? Other people are glass half empty so um, optimism and pessimism come into this. It's how you perceive uh, using your senses but your perception is likely not always accurate. In, in fact, it often isn't a reflective or reflection of reality. Your perception may be incredibly wrong based on the information that you received from your senses. And your brain has a really good idea about what it needs to survive. Your brain is really good about putting you in situations that are needed to survive. And one of the ways that it does that is that it can fill in gaps. And so if you look at this particular passage, and maybe you've seen this passage before, um, every pretty much every word in this passage is wrong. It's misspelled. It has letters in the wrong order. Yet you can very easily read through this particular passage, and and I'll just share that with you. But um, if I were to read this according to research at Cambridge University, it doesn't matter in what order the letters in a word are. The only important thing is that the first and last letter be at the right place. Right? And so it goes on to talk more about what it's happening. It's because the human mind can actually um, kind of fill in the gaps. And so it doesn't matter if a word or a passage is misspelled, you will often not notice the omission or the mistake in a word. Your brain just fills in the gaps because that it can perceive what the word actually should be or what the passage should actually say without it actually saying that, which is actually pretty cool. Um, another thing is if you um, if you look at this particular picture, our brains are also really good about applying knowledge that you've learned in the past to new situations. And so if you constantly ate 
strawberry flavored pink icing on a cupcake and you just artificially colored pink icing to be vanilla, right? Just took regular vanilla icing and you colored it pink. Um, you will have people that often associate the pink frosting to strawberry, even though nobody told them it was strawberry, right? Nobody told them that it was anything other than vanilla, but they still associate it, which is obviously incorrect. And so that's what I'm saying, that your perception uh, might not always be accurate, because in this case, it isn't, right? When you first saw that, you might have thought strawberry, and it is not. It's actually just vanilla, and so that was not accurate. It's always, um, not always a reflective of reality, which in this case is not, okay? These, in reality, are just vanilla that are just artificially colored, but you perceive them to be strawberry, and so therefore, we're incorrect, and it is not reflective of reality. But your brain is, is essentially playing tricks on you, but it's doing it uh, with your best interest in mind. So, perception is good. Um, it can lead you to incorrect assumptions. However, for the most part, perception is good, and so our brain, while faulty, is still good at providing us with the information we need to survive. It may not be good at making you perceive a particular cupcake flavor, right? But it is good at actually ensuring your survival, and so your brain does filter out information that it feels isn't necessary to survival, it fills in the gaps for missing bits of information that it feels are good for survival. And it also applies previous knowledge to new situations that it feels will increase your chances of surviving those new situations as they come. Um, you know, I'd say that's really good uh, and really helpful in most situations. But in the, in the realm of forensic science and observation skills, we have to understand what our limitations are to making good quality observations and we need to strengthen the skills that are necessary to make good quality observations because in a field like forensic science your observation skills are critical in not only acquiring the right pieces of evidence making quality connections between the right pieces of evidence and the crime scene and also working with witnesses, eyewitness testimony, um, and just working with all parties involved so that you can make sense of where their faults lie, where their brain is maybe perceiving uh, information they received incorrectly, and, and filling in the gaps to paint the entire accurate crime scene. Okay, so how is information processed in the brain? Here's a little infographic that can help kind of fill in the gap, so to speak, no pun intended, on how information is processed by the brain and how information is retained in our long-term memory. So we've talked several minutes now about how we receive information. We make observation based on our senses. That can be sight, smell, taste, touch, and hearing. We use our eyes, nose, ears, taste buds, fingers to make these observations, to pull in the information and send that information to our brain. So our brain is constantly receiving all of this information, and we're receiving a lot of it very quickly. It's all coming in at the same time. What we pay attention to is likely not everything that we're receiving. We are receiving information, like I said, about humidity, about temperature. But we're not sitting in a room literally thinking about the humidity not being the optimal for our particular skin type. right? We're not likely thinking about um, the light levels, the light intensity, the UV index, um, the, 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 the wind currents, so to speak, right? We have all this information that's being received by our brain, but we're, we're filtering out the things that likely don't play any bearing on our survival. And so what we pay attention to is actually a lot less than um, or a lot lower than all the information that we're actually receiving. So you can see that the number of arrows are dropping, and so we perceive even less than what we paid attention to. So we receive all this information. We pay attention to just a little bit of it, and we perceive or per make a perception about fewer items than what we have kind of innately paid attention to. We also commit smaller bits of what we perceive to our short-term memory and then even smaller bits to our long-term memory. If you think about everything that happened to you yesterday, 
you're probably not going to remember every bit of information that you even paid attention to at the time because you didn't commit that particular paid attention to to your short-term memory and definitely didn't play um, or commit it to long-term memory, right? Our long-term memory is very, very sparse with very, very specific bits of information that we obviously paid attention to at the time, but we don't commit everything to long-term memory. We just don't have enough computer space or mental space, mental capacity to commit everything to long-term memory, okay? So that's where we're gonna end this one. When we get back to uh, the next video, or in the next video, we're gonna start talking about how observations are crafted by witness. We're gonna talk specifically about eyewitness testimony, uh, but until then, see ya.